I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians and owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and elders from other communities who may be here today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Liam O'Connor today. Uh, of course, uh, it should be Doug Hilton who's uh, introducing him, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Doug was unavailable. And so, uh, and so Liam thought, well, he, he should find somebody else who he's admired for a many years and who's acted as a, <laughs> a mentor over all of that time, but unfortunately Andreas was also unavailable. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Liam, why don't you take it away? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Deva, for that introduction. So uh, here's what I'm going to talk about today, and um, I'm in a, a, a kind of s strange position because, believe it or not, uh, I've been back at Weehai now, uh, although it was part-time at first, for five years, and this is my five-year review, and like everybody else here, every five years I have to justify my existence. So, and one of the things you have to do with this is give a historical overview of what you've been doing and you know, since we got here and, and built the division. Um, however, if you're anything like me, you come to Wednesday seminars to hear data and to hear the latest results and to hear about science. And those two things don't necessarily fit together. So what you're going to get today is a sort of strange hybrid beast that is neither one thing nor the other, but I'll try and make it fit together as well as possible. This is a centaur, as drawn by the people who invented them. I don't know what the duck is all about, but <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, if the Systems Biology and Personalised Medicine uh, division was a corporate entity, it would have grown by merger and acquisition. Back in 2011, uh, when Doug and I were talking about what I might do if I, if I were to come back to Weehai, I was working elsewhere then at La Trobe, um, we talked about large-scale biology and, and the kind of things that, I, that I'm interested in doing. And I have been, you know, through my, well, since I did my PhD here many years ago. Um, I said, well, what about, you know, if, if I would do that, what, what's the proteomics, the genomics, the, the large scale uh, stuff? And he said, well, it's interesting you should say that because the proteomics is in a bit of a state of flux at the moment. Would you be interested in, in you know, taking the proteomics lab under your wing and, you know, looking after that? I said, okay. Um, and I should have known at that point in, in some respects, you know, in previous lives I used to work with a lot of uh, people who were ex-army and a lot of them would, would say to me, independently of each other, never volunteer. It, it's the one thing you never do in the army. If someone says, I'd like a volunteer for something, you should just... <laughs> Not that I mind because I've had a, a, a great time uh, with these technology labs and uh, as you'll see in the, the science bit of the talk, uh, half, maybe more than half, um, Without these labs in, in being the way they are, we, you know, we couldn't have done the things we've done. And then in September 2012, uh, the, the, the global organization of the Ludwig Institute's uh, loss was, was our gain, and a, a lot of labs joined WeHi from there, uh, among them some colorectal cancer labs uh, run by Peter Gibbs and Oliver Sieber. Uh, and then February, just after that, we formed the WeHi Genomics Hub again, uh, poaching Stephen Wilcox from uh, AGRF. And then in, in July 2013, uh, the Centre for Dynamic Imaging, Cytometry and Screening Labs, or HTCS Lab as it was then. HTCS Lab, uh, a little bit after that, we hired a, a head of screening, Hélène Jusset, and then late last year, uh, we moved the Screening Lab and the CTX Labs from Bandura to Parkville. So what I'm going to do now is just give you a, a brief overview of each of these things in this chronological order. What I don't want to do is steal the thunder of any of these people. They've all given Wednesday seminars or will be giving Wednesday seminars soon. But I would like to focus on one thing, and that's the amount of engagement of each of the technology labs in particular with the rest of the institute. Because to me, that's the measure of how well they're doing as technology labs, how many people... Uh, 
interacting with the labs and using this high throughput technology. It's not who's got the coolest box uh, and, and you know, does the latest things and has more lights. It's how many people are using it to do better experiments that tell us more about what's going on. So here's the data from the proteomics lab uh, since they started uh, keeping records in this format. And you can see that, as you, as you might expect, the number of samples they're running, these accumulative totals, are going up steadily. Uh, the, the number of people that are working with, with proteomics is going up now to the point where there's over, there, there have been uh, since 2014 when they started keeping these records, uh, nearly 140 different researchers at WeHi who have been working with the proteomic lab. And the number of labs uh, as well is, is now uh, closer to 70. Um, but this is something that uh, I know uh, Andrew, who heads the proteomics lab, is particularly proud of. If you look at collaborators per lab, um, it's not just that there's one person in a lab who does proteomics. There's more than one. This has grown from one to over two now. And, and, and I don't know whether it's plateau, but it's likely to continue to be rising. Proteomics is becoming more and more a part of the mainstream of what we do. And that's not really surprising because of the, the advances in, in proteomics. The things that are going on in the proteomics lab now, including label-free quantitation, more efficient database searching, and intact protein tandem mass spectrometry, where you, you don't cut it up into peptides at all, these guys are right at the edge uh, of what is happening. And in some ways, because of the revolution in, in genomics and next generation sequencing over the last few years, we have really taken our eye off what has been happening with proteomics. And there has been a similar technical advance. Uh, in the last 10 years, the, the ability to interrogate a complex proteome uh, in a quantitative and, and reproducible way and going deeper and deeper into the proteome has become the norm. So uh, then the labs from Ludwig joined in again. I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. Uh, Peter Gibbs and Oliver have, have both given Wednesday seminars. Uh, those of you with access to the WeHi internet can see those. Um, Oliver's isn't there because he's uh, shy about sharing it, but I'm sure if you go and talk to him, he'll explain to you the kinds of things he does. The Genomics Hub. When I got to WeHi, most of our next generation sequencing was outsourced to AGRF and, and various other suppliers, BGI. Um, and we, had, we decided then to adopt a strategy of letting this grow organically rather than going out and getting a whole bunch of money and buying a, a giant bunch of sequences to let demand drive this. And this is very much what Stephen has done since he started here. We started out with some very small scale sequencing instruments, uh, uh, iron turret machines, and then uh, as the number of sample, as the number of projects started to plateau off, uh, have acquired new instruments. And every time we increase capacity with NextSeqs, NextSeqs, and another MySeq, the number of projects continues to go up. To the, and the most recent, recent acquisition here is going to be revolutionary. Uh, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. So to date, there are 46 labs, 134 researchers, and nearly 1,000 projects have been doing NGS. NGS has become at WeHi a little bit like PCR, we kind of take it for granted. That wasn't always the case. We used to think of it as a complicated thing. Somebody else had to make the library and you had to outsource it. But you know, now we just make the libraries and sequence them. And things you should watch out for um, in, in the, the genomics hub, uh, single cell transcriptomics and single cell genomics uh, as, as we push that technology and long read NGS. Long read, uh, as it becomes cheaper and more available, is going to revolutionize what we do in this. I can, old enough to remember the days of early model microarrays and then better microarrays and long oligoarrays and then RNA-seq, which made us reinterpret a lot of our uh, transcriptomic results. And similarly, when we do long read and can read the entire m mature messenger RNA and we know all about splicing differences, it's going to change the way we think about transcriptomics. It's also going to change the way we do sequencing uh, with, with some mixture of long and short reads. And again, I won't steal Stephen Thunder because he'll be up here eventually talking about it himself. 
the Cooperative Research Center for Cancer Therapeutics, uh, Ian Street, Hendrik Falk, and uh, all the other guys in the lab. Um, Ian gave a Wednesday seminar a while ago, and he's uh, talked about this a great deal more ably than I would be able to. The only thing I want to stress here is since that talk, uh, uh, some compounds that have come out of, of this effort have been licensed by Merck. Uh, this is really, really surprising. Having spent a lot of my career on the other side of the fence and in pharma, uh, being pitched at by biotechs and academic labs saying they've got a great compound and it's gonna make it all the way and we're like, yeah, 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 believe that when we see it. Uh, to actually get this licensed by Merck and to be co-developing it is more unusual than you might think. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge achievement. Cytometry, what can you say about wee high cytometry? You don't see this strong upward growth. Um, you do see this cyclic variation, which uh, Simon thinks is probably seasonal. <laughs> uh, um, I think it might be something that's imposed on us by NHMRC grant season. Uh, either way, you can see there's over 200 different people a month coming in and using the cytometry lab. The reason you don't see this strong growth here is because they're already going flat out. Um, it, uh, the, the nature of it has changed, you know, sorts are shorter, there, there are more fluorophores now. But since 2013, 500 different researchers at Weihai covering 90 labs and nearly 80,000 hours of cytometry. Um, this is one of these things that, you know, we don't think about it. Until you go elsewhere where they don't have a very good fax lab, you might take it for granted. Um, maybe we shouldn't. What's coming soon? More fluorophores. Uh, there are new instruments now with uh, fluorescence-based sorting that uh, can detect up to 40 fluorophores, which is getting to, you know, sight off kind of capability. And unlike a sight off, of course, it doesn't completely atomize the sample and you actually can sort cells with it. And of course, access to the sight off itself. There's a sight off over the road and Simon has the antibodies and he's the man to see if you want to do those kinds of experiments, he and uh, Daniel. Screening. Um, Here's what's happened with screening lab projects over time. You can see they were growing steadily and then we moved from Bandura and everything went onto semi-trailers and, and now uh, they're ramping up again. But in some ways this is the wrong metric, uh, in fact in, in lots of ways. Um, the, the right metric is the sheer variety of things that go on in that lab down on the fourth floor. If we were working in, in the pharmaceutical industry and, and doing this kind of uh, compound screening, we would have labs the size of and bigger than our screening lab for each of these technologies, for each of these detection systems, and we would have assay development teams, probably one per project. The fact that these guys multitask and do all this stuff uh, and do it with, with, with you know, the, those small multi-purpose robots is absolutely extraordinary. And you know, I, in my pharma days, if I could have hired that few people with those few instruments to do this variety of stuff, I could have done a great deal more. Coming soon, high content screening, and I'll talk a little bit about high content, and I've tried to choose things when I start talking about drug resistance later on that uh, uh, feature these technology labs. So I'll, I'll talk about some high content data. And arrayed whole genome CRISPR screening. Uh, this is where we, we are just about to take delivery of, if everything goes well with the contract, uh, a whole genome set uh, of CRISPR reagents, one per well, and we're going to screen that in 384 well plates. And this will be game changing in terms of our ability to do functional genomics. Watch this space. The Center for Dynamic Imaging, uh, as, as we call the imaging lab, this is uh, hours logged on the microscope. Again, a, a, an imperfect and, and sort of blunt measure, but uh, it, it's one way to do it. This also has either seasonal or grant season imposed periodicity to it. Um, it's going up steadily, and you can see every time uh, new technology comes, there's a jump. Uh, 
Just last year, there were 160 people using the imaging lab, over 18,000 hours logged, 56 labs at Weihai. I want to keep stressing that what makes this place great is the perfusion of technology uh, into all the other labs. It's not seen as something separate. And I'll, I'll return to that point later. What's coming? This sounds kind of boring, data management. It's not. Image files are enormous. They're increasing all the time. If we don't keep track of them uh, in this way, we're soon going to be hosed. Faster analysis through virtual desktop infrastructure and, and the high performance computing that, that will be coming soon. And also, you know, we're trialing some cloud based solutions as well. Lattice sheet microscopy and super resolution, all these things are, uh, uh, these things are here and these things are more on the horizon. So, that's a very brief overview and, and purely stressing engagement uh, about what the technology labs have been up to. Now, why, why should we do this at, at, at a research institute like this? Why are we interested in technology? Well, uh, these are the Nobel Prizes in, in chemistry or physiology and medicine since 1990. Uh, these are the things that, uh, you know, we would all like to have. Here are prizes that have been given purely for a technology or a method. That's not bad. That's about 20% of the Nobel Prizes since then. And of course, the other 80%, I don't doubt for a second, were hugely, development, hugely dependent on the development of some new technology. And that's, uh, to me, uh, you know, one of the reasons. Uh, this is recognized by our, our colleagues in the scientific community as being an important thing to do, and it's game-changing when a new technology comes along. Who can remember, I can, the, the time before PCR, uh, you know, the, the time before GFP. Uh, these are, um, they have completely revolutionized the way we, we think about the experiments that we do. But for me, the, the stronger reason and, and the better reason to do that is that if you keep pushing your ability to do new things, you, you, you find things that you didn't know were there before. Uh, and, and that's what technology does. It's not there for its own sake. If we keep using existing technology, existing instruments, and look under the lamppost, we're not going to see what's out there in the dark. And that's been the history of, of science, you know, since we've gone from a telescope to the Hubble telescope. Uh, we need to have better instruments. We need to keep pushing the boundaries of what we can do. Better methods mean better results, mean better methods, and these things push each other in this virtuous cycle. Okay, back to our strange beast. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about tumor drug resistance, and particularly uh, an EGF receptor inhibitor that we've been interested in in the lab for quite some time now. And I'm going to try to join this onto the historical overview that I've been asked to give and make the two things work. Um, and it's up to you guys, I guess, to decide which part of the animal is talking at what time and uh, see what you think. Metastatic colorectal cancer. It causes over 4,000 deaths per year in Australia, and the median survival, if you're diagnosed with this, is less than two years. Cetuximab, which is an EGF receptor uh, inhibitor, is a second or third line uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, a therapeutic for metastatic colorectal cancer, and it costs $30,000 for, for one treatment. But uh, only 15% uh, will respond to cetuximab. Just a, a little reminder and, and a primer on the EGF receptor, the epidermal growth factor receptor, and how it is involved in uh, epithelial cell biology. The EGF receptor transduces its signal when it's, it's bound by EGF and TGF alpha. It's a heterodimer with a number of different partners for the EGF receptor, uh, including, and also it can homodimerize. The signal is transduced through RAS, RAF, and also here down through PO3 kinase um, to the usual things that we think of as the hallmarks of, of tumor development, proliferation, growth, and suppression of apoptosis. Now, this has been known about for some time, and of course, it's an 
eminently druggable uh, cascade. It has a lot of kinases, uh, GTP exchange factors, uh, all the things that the pharmaceutical industry has historically found amenable to, to uh, chemical intervention. Cetuximab itself is an antibody that blocks the binding uh, of ligand to the EGF receptor, but there have been a, a lot of other uh, small molecules, mostly kinase inhibitors. There's dasatinib, which is a, a SARC inhibitor. It's actually SARC able inhibitor. And there are uh, inhibitors of activated RAS and RAF, and sim similarly, uh, all the way through, and all the way down to, you know. Uh, blocking autophagy and uh, or uh, certainly uh, changing autophagy through things like rapamycin. So we are looking for uh, molecular explanations for why secondary tumors, these are tumors that, are, that arise as uh, metastases after a primary colorectal tumor, are becoming cetuximab resistant. Um, and we thought there might be some clues by looking at primary tumors. It turns out that uh, of, of people who uh, are diagnosed with primary colorectal cancer, only about 15% uh, are going to respond if they're given cetuximab monotherapy. A great many others will have activated KRAS. Some of these will have KRAS uh, and other uh, mu mutations. And there is this gray area of 20 to 25% of people who will not respond to this for reasons we don't know, because we're only looking at you know, three or four different molecular markers here, and you can see there's many different ways that the EGF receptor pathway can be uh, internally activated. Um, and uh, until we know more about this uh, and all the rest of these things, we won't know what's going on with, with, with chemo resistance. So if you treat these people with cetuximab, and then they subsequently relapse and have a secondary tumor, we thought, well, are some of these going to be the molecular markers of how the secondary tumor acquired resistance that it didn't have in the first place? CRISPR. Um, if you're talking about uh, Nobel Prizes for technology, I mean, watch this space. Uh, of course, there's going to be one for this. Uh, th this has revolutionized the way we think about functional genomics and, and gene editing, and it's still in its early stages. Uh, it probably doesn't need any introduction to this audience. Through this Cas9 enzyme uh, and these guide RNAs, you, you can make random mutations in, in genomic DNA, and uh, a, a lot of the time these will re result in, in functional inactivation of the gene through uh, non-homologous end joining. So what does the experiment look like? So we, we take a CRISPR library, a pooled CRISPR library, and infect some colorectal cancer cells with this library. And then we have a bunch of mutant cells, all with different mutations. We select them with cetuximab and clone out the different mutations, or grow out the different mutations, I should say, and ask the question, when we knock a gene out, which genes are conferring cetuximab, cetuximab resistance on these cells. And the, of course, the devil is in the detail with these kinds of experiments. They're not always easy to do. We would like to do them in you know, primary tumors. We can't do them in primary tumors. But maybe with the things that we're doing with organoid cultures at the moment, uh, that, that day will come. So we were looking for uh, a colorectal cancer line that's sensitive to cetuximab. Uh, that means it doesn't have any of the obvious mutations in the downstream EGF receptor pathway. It has to be transducible. Most things are with lentivirus. We have to be able to bulk this up really quickly. And because of the nature of the, the vector that we used, it had to be pyromycin sensitive. We tested a bunch of different cell lines. And we eventually landed on uh, LIM1215 cells. They're a microsatellite instable. Uh, they secrete TGF alpha, which suggests there might be a, a, an autocrine nature to the EGF receptor signaling. So we put the library in and then do 10 day infections. And uh, the reason this lasts so long, uh, this whole process, I'll, I'll talk about this uh, in the next slide or two, is that 
uh, cetuximab in, in tissue culture and at the concentration we're using it isn't cytotoxic, it's cytostatic. So what we have to do is infect the, the cells and then the, the cells that are cetuximab sensitive will stop cycling, but the ones that are resistant because of the mutation we've introduced will keep cycling. So we have to keep these cultures going a long time and we have to keep splitting them so that the, the cetuximab resistant cells get a chance to grow out. The problem with that, and of course we did the, the, the usual controls, the problem with doing an experiment like that is that it's not like some of the pooled CRISPR screens that you've heard about with things like necroptosis, where you're killing 99.9% .9 of the cells, and basically anything that lives is going to be interesting and resistant to necroptosis. Um, we expected quite a lot of things, to, we expected quite a lot of cells to be still there and us to be able to amplify the viral insert from these cells, uh, even though they had nothing to do with being resistant to the cetuximab treatment. And also we expected a significantly higher rate of what we call passenger virus that comes along. So this meant we had to do 48 replicates um, and it turned, and you know, each of these is a large tissue culture flask. It turned into a, a pretty giant kind of experiment. And these are the people that, for all the work I'll talk about today, has been done by Sam, Doreen, this is uh, Stephen Wilcox, who r runs the Genomic Hub. If Stephen hadn't have developed the ability to multiplex Illumina sequencing and the ability to sequence, you know, uh, 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 over a hundred different libraries in one Illumina lane, the logistics of doing an experiment of doing 48 uh, next generation sequencing w w would have been extremely difficult. But because he's developed this and the pipeline for analysis, this became a doable experiment and, a, and an affordable experiment. So here's what the cells look like, treated with the control antibody and uh, split uh, for, for several days. And here's what they look like when they're treated with cetuximab. You can see there are many fewer cells. You can't see it on this figure, but when we looked down the microscope, these cells had quite a different morphology to these as well as being fewer in number. And this led us to the idea that in these uh, LIM1215 cells, there's probably heterogeneity and at least some partial recapitulation of the ordinary CRIP cell development process and that we were going to be able to uh, see the effect of the mutations we were cloning on, and perhaps on, on uh, subpopulations of cells. This is a volcano or a tornado plot, depending on uh, where you were when, when we started to do this kind of stuff. Uh, so on this axis is plotted the enrichment uh, of any particular uh, viral insert uh, after cetuximab treatment and on this axis to separate the things that go down from the things that go up is, is the log fold change. So, uh, as you can see, lots of things uh, came out. Uh, many of the usual suspects, which is really reassuring uh, for this kind of experiment. Uh, NF1, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, CSK, uh, C-terminal SARC kinase, and I'll, I'll, we have cranking our way through these. And I'll just uh, illustrate this with a couple of them uh, for the rest of the talk. So C-terminal SARC kinase. The first thing you do with any of these things that you think is positive is go back to the original cultures and make sure that you really were inducing uh, a mutation that was going to disrupt uh, gene expression and uh, preferably ablate the whole gene. And indeed, that's exactly what happens with the CSK mutants. And from the same uh, clones, we got a lot of passengers that were irrelevant. And we know they're irrelevant because we did this multiple independent times and only took things where CSK was the, the common mutation. So we know we're knocking out CSK. And just a reminder of what CSK is. CSK, uh, C-terminal SARC kinase, phosphorylates and activates uh, SARC. And SARC is needed for the transduction of the uh, EGF receptor signal. So one of the things that occurs to us is if we are knocking out this, we're no longer activating SARC. And of course, it's blocking cetuximab, and it all makes sense. But we can test this. And also, I should mention CSK is frequently lost. 
in colorectal cancer. I thought that was the chicken for a moment. I, was, I thought you had a new electronic chicken and I was going to be... Um, there is a drug that directly inhibits SARC uh, and ABL uh, called dasatinib. So if what we're doing by knocking out CSK is, is inhibiting SARC and in that way rendering the cells cetuximab resistant, dasatinib ought to phenocopy this. So here's what happens when you, this is, what's plotted here is the, the percent increase of the CSK mutant versus controls uh, under various conditions. So you can see the cells normally don't have any percent increase because you're comparing controls with controls. Dosatinib itself doesn't have any particular effect uh, in, in the context of this mutation. Without the mutation, uh, and when you treat with cetux sorry, when the mutation is there and you treat with cetuximabs, you get a great many more cells because they're resistant. Uh, but desatinib does this and, and phenocopies the CSK mutation, or at least um, counteracts it. So uh, that's the kind of process that we're going through and, and have been through with each of those red dots you saw on the previous slide. We found a lot of things. Uh, a lot of the usual suspects and a lot of things that surprised us and I'll talk about some of the surprises uh, for the rest of the talk. These are all the things that we found that were uh, significantly enriched and, and conferred cetuximab resistance. A lot of the, the, as I say, usual suspects, NF1, negative regulators of RAF, uh, Epsin, there's a whole lot of these and we're doing the, the same kind of validation that you saw for CSK. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back at the end of the talk to why we're doing this. But now I just want to talk about something that we didn't expect uh, and that has piqued our interest uh, ever since. This is TBL1XR1. TBL1XR1 is a co-repressor, co-activator exchange factor. And it, it, it either derepresses or removes the repression machinery uh, from transcriptional sites uh, via the, the proteasome. So it's either partnered with NCOR to repress or under some conditions such as uh, uh, ligand binding or other kinds of transcriptional activation. Um, the, the, the transcriptional activation machinery is, is uh, subjected to proteasomal deprivation and it becomes a co-activator. So here's something that we're, we're, we've, we've cloned out and is conferring cetuximab resistance and it's clearly involved in controlling transcription. So the logical thing to do, for us at least, was a, an RNA-seq experiment. Again, uh, we couldn't just think about doing an, an RNA-seq experiment with the kind of replication and speed that we needed unless uh, the genomics hub was there. Now, here we, I've plotted um, the, the signed log p-value, uh, which you can think of as uh, enrichment of particular genes in an RNA-seq experiment uh, in, in, in mutant versus wild type without cetuximab treatment and in mutant versus wild type in the context of cetuximab treatment. So things that go up in the mutant are here, things that go down in the mutant are here, and I plotted them against each other in the context of cetuximab. So you can see that once you've actually mutated TBL1XI1, treatment with cetuximab largely doesn't make a lot of difference. It does have some differences that I'll come back to later in the talk, but um, these things are more or less on a line. So when you have this kind of data, one of the things you can do is say, well, What's, uh, as well as cherry-picking individual genes that we all love to do when we get a hit list and look down until we come to one that we have happened to have read a paper on and say that must be it, you can be a little bit more systematic than that, as you know, with pathway analysis. So what I've done here is project uh, the members of the, the, the notch pathway from, this is from Go, I think, not Keg, but they're... they're uh, the, the most highly regulated uh, genes uh, when, the no ooh, when the notch pathway is, is, is firing in cells. So these are things that uh, would normally go up in the context of activated notch and, and, and one of its ligand bindings perhaps disheveled. 
these are going down strongly in these cultures. So our guess straight away is that TBL1XO1 is, is having a transcriptional effect uh, on a great many members of the notch pathway, either directly or indirectly, you know, through the notch intracellular domain. <clears throat> so a little bit about intestinal crypt cell development and what is the likely cell that is the cetuximab target and what is the likely tumor progenitor cell. Um, crypt cell development in, in the normal intestine starts at stem cells at the bottom and their cell fates have been well and truly mapped and they work their way up the crypt until they become uh, um, enterocytes here on, on the outside. So uh, you can think of these lineages as, as arising in this way. There is a stem cell which gives rise to cells that are going to be absorptive enterocytes. These are the ones out here. Uh, DLL1, this is disheveled, the notch ligand secretory progenitor that leads to these, all, all these uh, different kinds of cells and the other cells including some self-renewing cells. So two things here. This group of cells is dependent on notch signaling uh, for its existence, uh, certainly for its proliferation. And the, the goblet cells, which uh, secrete mucin, are positive for this cell surface marker mucin too. And they're, they're kind of important uh, later on in the talk. So <clears throat> luckily, uh, the transcriptional programs associated with these cell types have been published and are available. Uh, we have uh, li lists of genes that are characteristically up and down regulated in these goblet cells these transit activating cells, as they call them in this paper, and the enterocyte and the stem cell. So we, we now have uh, a list of the expected transcriptional changes in each of these cell types, and we want to compare that with what happens in the context of TBL1, uh, XR1 loss. And here's an example. So if you plot goblet cell genes on this, and again, I'm showing these as plots. They all come out uh, on the right kind of statistical test. But uh, to illustrate the point, all the, all the genes here in green that should be going up in goblet cells or are characteristic of goblet cells uh, are going down in our cultures, including this one, mucin 2. And uh, a great many of the genes that are normally lost in goblet cells are enriched in these cultures. So we think we're losing the goblet cells or, or something very like them. And when you do this for all of these cell types, you can see we're losing goblet cells, losing these intermediary transit amplifying cells, and there's a concomitant increase in, in, in stem cell-like and enterocyte-like cells. So we're losing things out of here. Whether, uh, whether these things are genuinely increasing in number or just proportionately so, uh, I suspect it's the, it's the latter. So, it's really good because it tells us that our cell model is at least sufficiently heterogeneous and there's at least enough of the kind of things we associate with ordinary crypt cell development going on in this cell line that we can get some more insight into cetuximab mechanism of action, which is very reassuring. So um, what about this cell surface marker mucin 2? I don't want to talk about gene transcription forever. Um, one of the things we wanted was some functional validation of what happens to the mucin 2 positive cells in this culture uh, when we mutate TBL1XR1. Uh, this work, uh, again, couldn't have been done without Carl. Carl Luhuvius, uh, that's about as close as I can get to it in Swedish. Um, what we've plotted here, and, and this, the reason that Carl was so important is we did this on the Opera Phoenix high content screening instrument. What the Opera does, it's a plate-based uh, reader and it takes microscopic images and then it analyzes the images, uh, segments the cells out and counts fluorescent, either fluorescent cells or fluorescent nuclei or clumps of cells or whatever else you want. If you can define a, an image-based way to, to tell the software to segment around something. And it does this in an automated way. So what would have taken us a huge amount of time uh, doesn't take very long at all. You put this in a 96 well plate, you have a lot of replicates, the instrument takes multiple fields of view per well, 
and it counts the cells. So what we've plotted here are mucin-2 positive cells. This is an anti-mucin-2 antibody, and uh, all, all the isotype controls are there and, uh, and all the rest of it. Um, and then just plotted the number of mucin-2 positive cells normalized to, these are DAPI stain nuclei, normalized to total cell number in the well. And here's what wild type cells look like. You know, there's around 40 cells per well, which is around uh, five or so percent of the cells in culture. And again, this comes back to the point of the heterogeneity in the cell line. Clearly, these things aren't clones where the same thing is happening. There's heterogeneity there and there's enough recapitulation of crypt cell development that we can do these kinds of experiments with, with some confidence. And if you knock out TBL1, XR1, you lose them. Getting back to that whole uh, ramification of cells that were dependent on notch signaling. We think we're losing notch signaling. We knock out TBL1, XR1, and all the cells that lead eventually to become goblet cells and a mucin-2 positive are lost. So far, so good. But we also did an experiment where the cells were treated with cetuximab, and a surprising thing happened, and we've been puzzling about this and arguing about it and talking about it ever since. And these are the best kinds of experiments where you do the control and it doesn't give you what you're expecting, but you know it's true. And this gets back to this thing of looking under the lamppost. If your controls always do what you expect them to do, you're not really going to find that much new. So when we treat wild-type cells with cetuximab, we have a huge increase in the number of mucin-2 positive cells. That was really unexpected. Um, and when we treat the mutant cells with cetuximab, we get a, a, a similar ratio of increase. If, if, if you divide these two bar, the white bars into each other, it's the same ratio as the black bars. And for Davo's sake, I've shown what the error bars here. Um, so what's going on here? We, we have thought about this and debated it uh, at some length. G go back to those uh, cell lineages. We think that uh, cetuximab signaling through ERK activation is holding the production of these terminally differentiated mucin-2 positive goblet cells in check. Uh, and, and this would explain the, the, the results from that experiment. So uh, and I'll, I'll r run through why we think that is. So this is the, what happens in untreated cells. Uh, I've, so the mucin-2 positive uh, cell population here is, is just for illustrative purposes done in green like the, like the antibody. If uh, ERK signaling, which is normally associated with cell proliferation, uh, is, is active in these cells, um, they're probably not uh, as likely to go into a terminally differentiated state like a goblet cell. At least that's what we think. We don't know. We suspect that it's also important in these other terminally differentiated cells. So that's what happens in the normal case uh, and why we see around 5% or so of goblet cells in these cell cultures. But if we use cetuximab and knock out ERK signaling, we get many, many more uh, of these mucin-2 positive cells because the, the, the activated ERK is, is no longer holding them back. But if we knock out this whole path, the, these, all these, the, the progenitor cell here by ablating notch signaling with the TBL1XR1, we get many fewer around 1% or so, and that ties in with the data again. But if we then put cetuximab on top of that, that allows this subpopulation to increase again. So that's our model for, for what's going on here. Uh, and this agrees with the data uh, so far. And this is um, a, a work in progress. and. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to conclusions here because I know we have to be out by 2 o'clock and I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, so here's the potential outcomes of this. There's biomarker discovery for patient stratification. It's clearly no point in treating somebody with a, with a secondary colorectal tumour. Uh, you should really look at the notch pathway 
before deciding to treat that with cetuximab, as well as the other molecular markers that are in, uh, prognostic for cetuximab response. Because the EGF receptor pathway is so well drugged, uh, we're finding uh, potential antagonists because we're, we're finding, uh, we're, although what we find in a pooled screen like this are things that whose disappearance causes cetuximab resistance, we can find regulators of those or the things they regulate, as you saw in the, the case of CSK and SARC. Uh, really, to do this properly um, and to do it more thoroughly in terms of looking for combination or second-line therapeutics, we would need the kind of arrayed screening where you can see the loss of things in the context of uh, gene ablation, and that's coming soon. Um, we're finding out a lot about that drug resistance is more complicated uh, than, than people think. It's not always, like any biology, as simple as you first think. And we're finding out things about drug mechanism of action. So the questions we're asking now are around ERK uh, and the, the EGF receptor pathway. Is it true that um, active ERK is, is preventing terminal differentiation of those uh, notch-dependent cell lineages? And is this how things like cetuximab work? Are they cytostatic because they drive the cells into a terminally differentiated state? And then they're not cytotoxic in, in the way that a lot of other drugs are. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'm exactly on 50 minutes. This is everybody in the SBPM division. Um, you're going to hear from them all, and you have heard from many of them already, so I won't steal their thunder again. And I've already spoken about the people who are most involved with, with these projects. We couldn't do it uh, without uh, the generosity of the Australian Cancer Research Foundation, the NHMRC, the Ian Potter Foundation, Janko Inge Foundation, is George here? And um, I'll take questions. Thank you. I'll take uh, oh. Chairman's privilege and ask the first question. Okay. Go back about four slides. You see in the image of the cells, there are often pairs of mucin cells. And I was just wondering whether they had to, if, <coughs> if you think that's true, and whether you think they're dividing after they turn into a mucin expressing cell uh, or beforehand. You know? uh, so, you know, why, why aren't they all mucin expressing <coughs> cells? Obviously. Well, there's only 5% of them. This is the heterogeneity of this line. It seems, it seems more or less binary. They're either expressing mucin or they're not. You know, it's not like a, a gradual. No. Um, but see how there's a lot of pairs? Do you think yeah, they're... Um, maybe it's worth looking at. Is uh, a cell... Great binary? point. You know, we can actually plug for high-content screening. You can actually... Uh, one of the things you get out of a high-content high data set is the XY location of the centroid of the cell. So we can say, are these things really more likely to be in pairs or not. Up the back there. Um, so you spoke about arrayed CRISPR libraries. I'm curious as to whether you can do this with any CRISPR library or whether it's a specific library that's been arrayed. Uh, it's explicitly a, a library that's been arrayed. Uh, we can't array libraries ourselves, uh, where we've been in long and tortuous negotiations with, with a commercial provider. Um, we. I suspect if we had our time over, we, we would have just arrayed the library ourselves. But uh, turning from a pooled library to an arrayed library, uh, it, it's not so much that it's hard to deconvolute what you get as you clone the library out. What's hard is high throughput plasmid preparation and library packaging. Uh, but given how long it's taken us to persuade someone to make <laughs> an arrayed library, um, uh, we may well think about that for you know version two. No, no, you're the... Uh, Tim, <coughs> do you know the... It could, um, given that it's, uh, that it's doing that, that kind of regulation. Um, HDAC inhibitors, as you know, f far better than I, uh, certainly the drugs, uh, not very clean drugs. I mean, that there is a, there is a, a marketed HDAC inhibitor from Novartis, my, my old home, um, which 
almost certainly doesn't work by deacetylating histones. It's a, it's a broad spectrum deacetylase. Yeah. But it could also, what you're saying, it could also be active. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, throwing in some HDAC inhibitors would, would sort that out. Great idea. I'm just wondering, you've tried one specific type of colorectal cancer cell and found this effect of the microtranscriptional regulator. Um, it extends to other types of colorectal cancer cells. Uh, great question. Um, we've tried. The, the RNA-seq experiment wa was in one kind, uh, and we chose that, uh, and then the subsequent uh, high-content stuff uh, was in that because there was a higher proportion of mutant 2 positive cells in there, and we'd have something to count in the first place. But yeah, uh, watch this space. One thing that we would very much like to do, and we're talking with, with Chin Wee and Tony about, is doing this in organoids. I'm just wondering if having sort of I understood it correctly to predict that the combinations of Tuxedan and Notch inhibitor would work together. But is that a way that you'd be able to do that? In, in, a, in a human, I mean, Notch inhibitors have problems with that. Yeah, Notch inhibitors are. Um, well, the, the, there's all kinds of notch inhibitors. The most common one is a gamma secretase inhibitor that stops the release of the intracellular domain. We're doing those kinds of experiments now. It's, they're sometimes difficult to interpret because if you put in a gamma secretase inhibitor, it does, as you say, all kinds of things to the cells. That's why there haven't been very good drugs. Notch itself is variously implicated as a tumor suppressor or an oncogene, depending what you read. Um, so then going, you know, inhibiting something that has pleiotropic effects with a drug with, that isn't a very clean drug anyway, uh, the, the possibilities for interpretation are endless. So, but we're, we're definitely trying the gamma secretase inhibitor in combination with cetuximab. Last question. Nobody's brave enough? No? All Good. Right. So let's uh, thank Glenn for a terrific talk.